And uh, Brian Day and I have actually been working together for about a dozen years on uh, various uh, teacher workshops here in the Bay Area. And so it's always a, de a delight to bring him to uh, our audiences, no matter where, uh, who they are. So Brian works at NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, where he serves in lead positions for lunar and planetary mapping and modeling, citizen science, and outreach. He is a member of the site selection and analysis teams for the Resource Prospector and Lunar Mission 1 missions to the moon and is supporting analysis of potential human landing sites on Mars. Brian was the EPO lead for NASA's LCROSS and LADEE lunar missions. Brian has participated in a number of NASA Mars analog field studies, working in extreme environments here on Earth that share some characteristics with Mars. In 2007, he flew on the Origa Mac mission to record fragments of comet Kais, or maybe it's Kies, uh, Brian can correct me uh, when, I, uh, when he gets on, entering Earth's atmosphere. So please welcome Brian Day. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and a pleasure to show off some of the tools that uh, we're developing. Um, I'll just talk about some of these planetary mapping and modeling tools that we're showcasing. These are done uh, under the auspices of the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. And uh, these tools are actually developed by our crack genius development team down at JPL. Uh, this team is led by uh, Emily Law, and I really want to take a great deal of pleasure tonight in showing off the brilliant work that they've been doing and boasting about how wonderful they are. Um, we're going to start out tonight looking at uh, Mars. And so what we're looking at here is Mars Trek. This is our Mars visualization portal. And uh, you can see that we can pan, we can zoom, we can explore the surface of Mars. Uh, for instance, here we can see Mars's Grand Canyon, Valles Marineris. Uh, the neat thing about these tools is, as you'll see, they allow us to visualize planetary surfaces as seen through the eyes of a variety of instruments aboard a number of spacecraft. And we also have a number of tools we can use. So for instance here, using the line tool, I can draw a line along a length here, a portion of Valles Marineris, and we can actually measure a distance, as you can see. So that's, that's useful in and of itself. Let's draw another line. This time what we'll do is we'll go across the chasm, something like this, and you'll see that we can actually do an elevation plot and we can look at the heights and depths of surface features on Mars. So uh, also very cool. Um, but one of the tools that people enjoy the most is this one here. I'm going to draw a box around a particular area and you can see if I click it, one of the op options here is to generate an STL. That's a file that goes to your 3D printer. So if you happen to have a 3D printer, you can just draw a bounding box over whatever area you are interested in. And I'm gonna jump out of the uh, screen share here. Hopefully you can see, this is an example of a 3D print that came out of uh, this product here. So that's a really neat feature and um, people are enjoying that immensely. So what we're going to do now is let's take a look at this same area. This is, this is Viking imagery. But again, let's look through the eyes of a different instrument. So what I can do is I can look at the various layers here and we can go to, in this case, we'll go to the Mars Global Surveyor and we can see that there's a color hill shade laser altimetry view and we're going to load that up here quickly hopefully uh, I am speaking to you from a hotel in Orlando right now and the internet connection here is perhaps not the best but you can see it's still working and 
what we've done here, this is a laser altimetry view, and we're color coding altitude. So blue is lowest, green is higher, orange and red, and then gray to successive heights and climbing up to the heights of the great volcanoes, of course, of Mars. Uh, so this is a really neat way to visualize. Again, if we take a look at the details of that, we can see there's a nice scale here that explains to you what colors correspond to what altitudes. Um, this is, again, a great way to really visualize almost in 3D, but why do almost 3D when you can really do it? So we'll switch to our 3D mode here. We have a globe and we can actually look at Valles Marineris in this 3D representation. We have game controls. So if you happen to be familiar with these standard uh, gaming controls, you can go right, left, up, down, zooming in and so what we're going to do here is we're going to just fly right into Valles Marineris. Now we have a tiling server here so as you zoom in the uh, resolution improves. You can just fly right into the valley there. Um, what we'll do now is again let's switch to a different view. So now we'll go to the Mars Odyssey spacecraft the Themis instrument and daytime infrared view. And here it tiles in. So again, we can appreciate the uh, surface as seen through a variety of instruments aboard a variety of spacecraft. So again, let's drop down we can fly right into Valles Marineris, as you can see. We can even turn our view, look down the length of the valley, and fly down the valley. Uh, you can similarly do flyovers of the peaks of the great volcanoes. It's really a lot of fun. It engages the public uh, in a very spectacular way. We also have a series of bookmarks, and these bookmarks allow you to go to some of the landing sites that we've been to. So for instance, uh, we can go to the Curiosity landing site. And it's loading again. I. Uh, my apologies for the slow hotel internet here, but you can see what we're doing is uh, we're loading the actual view of, in this case, Gale Crater, and I'm gonna pull back here and give you a view of, a kind of a panoramic view as it loads here. And you can see that actually we're using several different data products in doing this. So I'll wait for it to load. So we have uh, we have a mixture of imagery here. From the widest view is the Themis again daytime IR from the Mars Odyssey spacecraft. Then we have in higher resolution showing the entirety of Gale Crater here, uh, imagery from the context camera aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And so let's go ahead and fly you down. You can see the central peak there in Gale Crater, Mount Sharp. And we'll let that fill in a little bit here. The context camera gives us excellent resolution. But then, as we approach the vicinity of where Curiosity is currently roving, we're going to be loading in the 
uh, data from the high-rise camera. It gets us down to the best resolution we can achieve, achieve from orbit. And what we'll do is we'll just go sit down on the ground right next to the uh, rover. So if we pan up, we can pan across the terrain. Looking at the path where the rover has traveled. Looking back up at Mount Sharp. And we can drop down. Notice the dunes here. And we will continue to drop down. And we'll just put ourselves down on the ground. And there's a rover's eye view of Mount Sharp. So there are a lot of neat things we can look at in Mars Trek. Um, let's take a more global view here. So uh, again, what we're going to do is let's again take a look at this wonderful laser altimetry view. And as we do, we can see really the amazing early history of Mars as told by the features clearly indicating flowing water. So, for instance, here, looking at Eris Vallis and looking at the features that were clearly streamlined by flowing water. It doesn't really take a great deal of imagination to realize which direction the water was flowing. Uh, similarly, let's head out to Casse Vallis. And again, note the incredible detail here in showing the way that water has flowed. Now, if we take a 3D look at this area, and we'll just kind of, let's zoom out a little. We notice that there's an interesting dichotomy between the north and south of Mars. We have this low area to the north that really is indicative of where we think that there might once possibly have been a Martian ocean. So you can see the water having flowed out these many outflow channels into this large basin that really spans the entirety of the uh, northern part of Mars. It's been interrupted a little bit here by some volcanic activity, but you can see very widespread. In this area called the Borealis Basin, uh, people hypothesize, might actually represent an impact basin from very, very early in Mars's history. This would be such a large basin that it is even thought that uh, perhaps this actually excavated down into mantle material. So there's a lot of interest in looking at this history of Mars as revealed by these indicators of Mars's wet and perhaps warmer past. Now, because of all of this, of course, we're very interested in further exploration of Mars, and uh, we're starting to actually plan not only additional robotic missions to Mars, but human missions to Mars. And at this point in time, roughly 50 sites are being looked at, are being investigated. Now, as you saw before, we have these wonderful bookmarks that allow you to look at some of our previous landing sites. Uh, we're in the act of adding to that now with the upcoming 40th anniversary of Viking. You'll, see, you'll soon see Viking there. But we're also adding 
those 50 potential landing sites, or roughly 50 potential landing sites. And the idea being that you will be able to follow along and understand these particular areas of interest, why we find them so interesting, and uh, join us as we go through the selection process. Now, certain aspects of Mars Trek will be actually used by our researchers to help actually analyze these sites. There'll be additional tools added so you can explore them in great detail. What I'd like to do right now, though, is give you kind of a sneak peek at uh, a couple of these areas. Um, okay, of course, you can't think of going to Mars without looking at uh, Valles Marineris. So here we'll zoom in and there's this area of Mars here called Melis Chasma and it's a portion of Valles Marineris and it's one of the areas, one of these areas that's being seriously considered. And a reason behind that is, well, it's nice and low, uh, which gives us uh, ample opportunity to use the thicker atmosphere to slow our descent. The walls here of the canyon, actually much like the walls of the Grand Canyon, give you a wonderful stratigraphic column detailing the geologic history of Mars. Also, you'll find that in this area, as we zoom in, there are places where we see the recurring slope lineae, where we see that water seems to be flowing just beneath the surface. And in large portions of this area here, we also find hydrated minerals, uh, particularly polyhydrated sulfates. They can be as much as 50% water by volume. And if you're planning to live and work on Mars, that is an irresistible resource because we are going to depend on in situ resource utilization. You won't be able to get all your supplies from Earth. We're going to have to learn how to live off the land on Mars. So that's one potential area. Some places we're not going to go, as exciting as they are, are the uh, tops of these wonderful volcanoes. Uh, they're just too high, and you don't really get a chance to use the atmosphere to slow down. So we're looking at lower areas. Uh, along the Casse Valles here, we're looking, this is certainly, again, the history of water uh, is very evident here. And of course, the reason that we're so tied to water is because, you know, there's, there's obviously been liquid lo water flowing here. And here on Earth, wherever we find liquid water, even if it's in the boiling springs of Yellowstone, even if it's beneath the frozen ice cap of Antarctica, even if it's in the cooling systems of a nuclear reactor, wherever we find liquid water, we find life. So, Areas that were once sites of liquid water and may still be sites of liquid water are, of course, of great interest to us. Now we're going to look at a site. This is the dichotomy boundary Deuteronomus mense. It's a mouthful. But what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on this area here that was right on potentially the shore of this ancient... Uh, possible ancient Martian ocean. So as we go along this shore here, you'll see that there's this ancient Hesperian Age crater. It's cut through by outflow channels, so water has clearly flown, flowed through here. Again, the walls preserve a record of the geologic history of Mars. But as we zoom in, now I'm going to switch views again. So let's go to our Mars Odyssey, the daytime infrared view. And we'll drop in a little closer. We'll see something pretty amazing. 
So look at the floor of this crater here. It looks fairly standard in this area, but around the edges of the crater, you see these really strange billowy landforms. And especially look here, this tongue of material sticking out. Let's get a little closer. And as we look, we begin to realize that what we're looking at here are actually debris-covered glaciers. So this site, which is only about uh, 39 degrees in latitude, so it's not in the extreme north, but it has ample supplies of water. Now, of course, there was the original question, do these represent rock glaciers, essentially fossil gl glaciers, where the rock that was rock debris lying on top of them is left behind and the ice beneath has long since melt. Or are these true debris covered glaciers? And uh, fortunately, some of our ground penetrating radar equipment in orbit, the Sherrod instrument has actually been able to penetrate this area and see that in fact, what we have here is a few meters of rock covering, in some cases, hundreds of meters of ice. So these are actually active glaciers. And uh, I'm gonna pull down here, we'll pull back and look at another example. Look at this beautiful tongue of glacial flow right here. Very, very impressive. So these are the types of areas. These are just a few. I mean, there are close to 50 of these just amazingly fascinating sites. And uh, last fall, we spent a number of fascinating days down in Houston going over these sites. And you can see why people are so excited. So uh, this is a view of Mars Trek here. And uh, I know we don't have a whole lot more time here, but I'm going to show you some more uh, of our portals. We're going to jump now to Vesta. This is the asteroid Vesta. And we have a portal for Vesta. It's vestatrack.jpl.nasa.gov. And again, very similarly, you can pan, you can zoom. And you can uh, look at some of the fascinating history of Vesta. So let's do that right now. Uh, what we're going to do is here, we'll switch to a south polar view. And let's bring up again some altimetry to really uh, show this off. So we'll do this color hill shade view again. And here, this helps us actually better visualize something that happened to Vesta in the distant past. You can see that there's this large, I mean very large, impact basin here, Rhea Silvia. About a billion years ago, a significant asteroid hit the south pole of Vesta and nearly resulted in the disruption of Vesta. Uh, we'll see evidence of the havoc that was caused by that a little bit later on here, but you can use this to really visualize the size. You can, of course, use the tools to measure it if you want. So we can measure across here, and we can see 563 kilometers. It's a big impact basin. But if we look closely, we can see that it overlies another similar basin. This is Venenia, about two billion years old. And we see that Vesta has now twice survived severe insult to its south polar regions. Um, so what we'll do here is let's go back to our global view. And in looking at our global view, you can see these striations going across the surface. These are graben, essentially cracks 
that were formed uh, that actually span the surface, span the equatorial region. Let's go to a 3D view here, and you can see how these encircle Vesta. Also, you can see the distinctly uh, non-circular shape of Vesta. Vesta, when it initially formed in its early days, did achieve hydrostatic equilibrium, and so it was spherical, but now you can see a good chunk of the southern portion of Vesta is in fact missing, and uh, that is because of those large impacts we looked at. Uh, we can actually find the scattered debris of that as we look in telescopes. There's a whole asteroid family called Vestoids that represent that debris from the south polar region of Vesta that has been spattered across the solar system. And some of that trail of debris has even intersected the Earth, and we find it here on the ground in the form of meteorites, specifically the Diogenites, the Eucrites, and the Howardites. Those types of meteorites all represent material from Vesta. The Howardites are regolith breccia from the surface, the eucrite represent surface lava flows and the diogenite rock from deeper down. So again, the cool thing here is being able to spin a Vesta like a globe. There are lots of stories to be told. So we can see these Divalia false here, these cracks going across the surface. Um, Here's a very eye-catching feature here. These three craters, uh, often referred to as the snowman. And what we'll do now is we'll zoom in on the lower crater there, the crater Marcia. Now we think of Vesta as being just a rocky body, but there is evidence that there is ice mixed in with this rock. And that evidence takes the form of a really interesting, unusual landform. So I'm gonna try and zoom in on that here. And you'll notice Right here, this strange, really interestingly shaped morphology here. This is an example of what we call pitted terrain. And what this appears to be is an area where ice beneath the surface was heated, probably by a meteorite impact, perhaps the impact here that uh, was caused by, that caused Marcia and that ice was volatilized and erupted as gas, forming this strange pitted terrain. Again, there are other examples of this across the surface of Vesta. We can take a look at this again using uh, our different layers. So we can, if we take a look at our mineralogy ratio here, and wait for it to load, we can see that, that area, this area actually does stand out. So there's clearly something interesting going on here. But of course, one of the most fun things to do is to actually use the controls here to fly around. And so we'll do that briefly here. So again, you can just fly along the craters. This is all data from NASA's Dawn mission. It allows you to skim, we can skim the surface here in pretty amazing detail. Now, some of the new things that are going to be coming out is we're going to be looking at uh, adding some additional data layers in the near future. Uh, 
Tim Stubbs uh, has done some wonderful research that is going to provide us with uh, illumination and temperature maps. Again, that has great bearing on potential ice deposits as we look across Vesta. So now I'm going to switch to the moon. And this is, this is actually our original portal, Lunar Mapping and Modeling Portal, lmmp.nasa.gov. And again, we can, of course, pan and zoom across the moon. And what we'll do here is, for instance, let's zoom in on this case, the area where Apollo 15 visited, looking at Hadley Rill, and we can go into great detail. But what I want to do here is take a little bit of a broader view and look at this sinuous rill stretching across here. And we can actually see the tail of volcanism. We can see the actual eruptive centers here from which the rill flowed. And of course, we can uh, use our tools, a little bit different interface here, but we can use the tools to, again, measure the distance there. That's, yeah, that's five and a half kilometers across. That is a good sized vent there. So this tells us a really interesting story. You can tell it, say, telescopes if you're doing a star party. This is something that is visible in telescopes at the right time of uh, sun angle. And you can see going from the heights of the Apennine Mountains out into the vast lava plains of Mare Imbrium. But this shows dramatically uh, the flow of lava. Perhaps a little bit easier to visualize in a telescope. This can be a little bit challenging. But the, lar the greatest example of a sinuous rill is Schroeder's Valley. And let's head over to that. I'll zoom out a little. And here, this is a very easy uh, rill to see. Again, the greatest example, the largest example of a sinuous rill on the surface of the moon, right near the crater Aristarchus. You can see the eruptive vent right here. It's been named the Cobra Head for fairly obvious reasons. And so again, this is a good example of volcanic activity on the moon. Now, neither of these rills that we've looked at actually bear much resemblance to what we would term a volcano. Uh, and with all these vast lava fields here across Mare Imbrium and here Oceanus Porosolarum, you would expect, gee, well, where are the volcanoes? Well, there are volcanoes. As a matter of fact, right here, we are looking at one of the most spectacular groups of volcanoes on the surface of the moon. Hmm. Doesn't look that spectacular, does it? But again, we can change our view. So instead of looking, uh, this is uh, the wide area camera on Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Now let's go ahead and again use the tool of laser altimetry. And here we can see um, There the volcanoes pop into view. These are the Marius Hills. So again, I'm going to, and what we can do is when we look at our layers, we can turn that view on and off. We can see that that laser altimetry really helps. Now again, we can measure the size of one of these volcanoes nine kilometers. Okay, that's nothing compared to what we uh, what we see on Mars. It's not like the great shields of Mars. 
the great shields here on Earth, on Venus. These are small volcanoes, and they're very low profile. That's why they don't show up so well in the WAC images. The typical volcano on Mars is a very, very, very low shield. But these are small shields, and the question is, and has been for a while, well, where are the great shields? You have Venus and Earth and Mars with these great shield volcanoes. Why would the basaltic volcanism on the moon be so different? Well, it turns out those shields are there. And let's demonstrate that. We'll draw a line through the volcanic complex here. And we'll do an elevation plot. And again, I'm enjoying the uh, speed of my internet connection here. But here we can see that, as a matter of fact, this whole complex of domes is sitting upon a very hard to see, large, broad shield here. We're seeing it show up with great vertical exaggeration here. But this is one of several examples of the fact that we do have large shields on the moon. They are very, very, very low profile because of the fact that the magma erupting on the surface of the moon, the typical lava flowing across the surface, had very low silica content. And that meant it had very low viscosity. It was very similar to, say, the viscosity of olive oil at room temperature. And it's pretty hard to build a steep mountain out of something like that. But using a tool like LMMP, we're able to actually visualize that large shield that underlies this complex of small cones. If you've ever been to, say, Hilo in the on uh, the big island of Hawaii, and you've looked up at Mauna Kea, and you've seen the cinder cones atop the broad shield of Mauna Kea. This is somewhat reminiscent of that. Now let's see what else we can see, because again, here in the case of uh, LMMP, which is our original and fullest featured portal, we have over 700 layers of data. Uh, just here, looking at LRO, you can see we have just all kinds of data here. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is pull up a gravity map. So now we're looking at this same area, but this is a gravity map showing red is higher local gravity, green lower and blue lowest. And what this allows us to do is take a really interesting look because one of the things we can do here is you'll notice we can have multiple layers up and within the layers we can actually adjust the transparency. So now I've got, for instance, I've stacked layers, so I've got the gravity sitting on top of the laser altimetry. And I can adjust the transparency of the gravity map so I can see the laser altimetry beneath. And so now we can see both the surface features and this gravimetric representation, which allows us to look below the surface and actually visualize the now solidified plug of unerupted magma sitting beneath this volcanic structure. So this is a really powerful aspect of these tools. The ability to stack multiple layers and adjust them, adjust the transparency, so that you can essentially mine the data that you want out of the combined union of all of these layers. That's really very powerful. And as you can imagine, it can be an act of some creativity stacking and adjusting the layers just right to show the information you want. Now, as you can well imagine, at some point after going through all that work, you might want to save that 
or even share that with your friends. And as a matter of fact, you can do that because within our portals, you can generate a URL that encodes exactly what you have done here. So the zoom levels, the location, the layers, the adjustment to the layers, and so you just copy that URL, and then you can put it in an email, send it to your friends, and this is one of the really different aspects to these portals is that these are all purely web browser based. You do not have to install any additional software. So all they have to do is once they get that URL, they can just paste it into their browser and boom, it takes them right to the data that you had arranged. You can see the layers, the adjustments, it makes it very easy to share. Similarly, let's zoom out here and I'm going to, let's head down to a different area. Just looking at some of the stories we can tell. Here is Mari Humorum, right here. And let's look at the edge of Mari Humorum. And as we do, we see this series of concentric arcuate rills here, the Hippolus rills. And these are actually graven. These are extensional features. And what happened is as the impact basin that formed Mari Humorum eventually started filling with lava, and that great burden of lava, as it filled in here, weighed down this surface on the crust, and this whole area sank. And as it sank, the regions around the edge were stretched and broken in these concentric rills. We can see similar features happening over on the other side here, a little more subtly, but they are there. So there are stories here that are very interesting to tell in terms of an active history on the moon. And just as you would have extensional forces here causing these cracks, as all this material sank, you would expect to have compressional features forming. And sure enough, here they are in the form of these wrinkle ridges that were essentially formed by thrust faulting by this material, all this sinking, crust of now solidified magma sinking down and bunching together. So there are some real utilities to doing this in the field. If you're doing, say, a star party, a lot of times you will find that people looking through a telescope may have trouble focusing on what it is that you're trying to describe to them. And so having a screen up like this where you can point out to them what it is they're going to see. And then you can actually use this to help tell the stories of what is going on. So that's, again, very, very exciting, very useful. There are a lot of changes coming about to all of these portals, a lot of things uh, that are going to be happening soon. Uh, in terms of LMMP, we, you'll notice that the interface here is a little bit different than what you saw with Best Than Mars. We will be migrating LMMP to the uh, same interface. In addition, we're going to be adding a lot more data. You know, hey, we've got over 700 layers now, but we're adding more, specifically polar data, uh, supporting the resource prospector mission. We're going to be adding a lot of very exciting data from Diviner. A um, lot of new interesting things coming. Much greater coverage by the uh, NAC, the narrow angle camera. So there's a lot coming to LMMP. I mentioned how Vestatrek is going to be getting uh, the new layers for temperature and illumination. And Mars Trek, of course, is going to be uh, dramatically enhanced with the ability to do analysis of and to 
follow along as we explore the exploration zones, the proposed human landing sites on Mars. So keep an eye on all of these projects, all of these products. There are a lot of exciting things to come. So um, let's see, I see we're getting a little bit on in time here. Do we want to open this up for uh, Q&A at this point, Brian? I think so. I think we've got uh, a number of uh, really good questions here. And so let's see what we've got. And so we'll kind of go back in time a little bit to Mars. And so we have a question from Doreen. Uh, was the curiosity path that was shown in the visual visualization current and up to date? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was thought that uh, curiosity was actually closer to Mount Sharp than what was shown. It is, and I am right now working on the updates to both Curiosity and Opportunity. So you will be seeing those along with the Viking uh, uh, depictions very soon here. Okay. So we have another uh, question that uh, um, Jeffrey found the talk about the glaciers interesting, but doesn't the ice just turn to gas in the low air pressure? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, interesting enough, if it's cold enough, it will not sublimate. So, again, of course, Mars has the ice caps uh, that uh, you have. The carbon dioxide certainly uh, does turn to gas very frequently and seasonally. But uh, in the case of the water, it is cold enough that it is... Uh, in this case, below the sublimation point. And so that ice remains as ice. And one of the challenges ahead of us will be to take that, in this case, when it's that cold, it is really hard ice, and turn that into a usable resource. And one of the discussions that's going on now is how do you, how do you liberate the water from that ice? And it could be something as simple as once you expose it, scrape the rock off of it. Um, maybe you do something as simple as put a big black tarp over it and allow that tarp to actually cause the temperature to rise and uh, be able to claim some of that water. Okay, well, staying with the theme of water, um, we have a question that how can they see the water flowing beneath the surface? Oh, that's very good. So. We have the ability, um, if you can bear with me, I'm going to see if I can pull up, a, find a movie. So I will, uh, I'm going to talk here as I look, and there are some interesting things that we find on the surface of Mars, uh, we find these ancient, ancient views of where water has flowed, but then we also see, in some cases, fresh looking gullies. Um, and let me see here if I can actually. I'm having trouble finding it right now, but let's let's just discuss it. So, and and we can. I'll provide some pictures a little bit later here. Um, oh, wait a second here. Just a second. View normal. Here we go. I am going to be able to show this. I think. Okay. And share screen. So here we can see some actually fresh looking gullies on the surface of Mars. And so 
some of these goalies, if we look, we actually see seasonal changes. So from one season to the other, we see these new deposits. But here's where it gets really spectacular, is where we see over seasonal, these seasonal changes over time here, resulting in, you can see these dark streaks moving down the slope of the uh, hill there. And we've come to realize that that is indicative of water flowing just beneath the surface and actually being wicked up to the surface through the sand there. And we see deposits of, uh, again, hydrated materials, salts, that are uh, coming out of this flowing water. So this is, this is really exciting. Because again, we have known that the surface of Mars is this really, really terrible desert. But in a number of places, for instance, uh, the Phoenix Lander, it was able to scoop the ground and see ice just beneath the surface. But that was very high up in northern latitudes. As we got, drop down, some of that water seasonally, or some of that ice seasonally does turn to liquid water and can flow at a low enough uh, altitude and again protected beneath the surface of the ground there. So this is, this is really exciting stuff. And so these areas of, we call these right here, recurring slope lineae. And these recurring slope lineae are grabbing everyone's attention right now. They're interesting from a biological standpoint. Hey, if you're gonna look for water, this is probably where you want to dig a hole, or if you're going to look for life, this is where you're probably going to want to dig a hole. And also, this could conceivably be a very valuable resource for people living and working on Mars. So, okay, so we've got another question uh, kind of sticking with the idea of uh, rocks on, on Mars. Uh, without rock samples, how can we actually tell the age of the features on Mars? Ah, oh, very good. Um, we can make inferences by looking at, crater, by doing crater counts. So one of the things that we have come to realize is that fresher, newer real estate, like the areas around the volcanoes, uh, is going to have a much lower density of impact craters than you would have in some of the older areas. So let's take a look. Um, I will jump to back to Mars Trek and let me share my screen. So let's zoom out again. I'm going to, oops. So, As we zoom out, we can see that this highland area is more densely cratered than this area here where we had water flowing across the surface. So we would infer that this is newer terrain than this area here. This is actually uh, this area here is Arabia Terra. This is actually one of the uh, older areas on the surface of Mars. And you can tell that because this area has been exposed for a long time, over the billions of years, the meteoroid impacts have continued and have continued to be recorded. Whereas here the flowing of water has erased a lot of that. So this is newer terrain. And so by making some assumptions about the rate of impacts, we can assign ages. Now, it's certainly a lot rougher in the case of Mars than it is on the moon, where we actually were able to calibrate those 
relative dates that we saw from crater counting on the moon with actual samples that were brought back from the moon. And then we were able to get actual hard dates that we could then calibrate those relative dates with. We want to bring back samples from Mars. That will allow us to do that calibration and really get our dating of features much more precise for Mars. Excellent question. Okay, so uh, I apologize to some of you in advance that we're not going to be able to get to everyone's question. Uh, we do have uh, several questions. I want to kind of turn to uh, kind of the portals themselves here. Uh, a number of people were asking about uh, uh, the potential of new ones, such as, as our ones for Venus uh, in the works, Pluto, perhaps Saturn, Jupiter, um, some of the other bodies uh, in the solar system. So yes, we are thinking of a number of additional uh, portals that we want to work on. Uh, you can imagine uh, a few of them are fairly obvious. We've got, uh, of course, we've, we've done Vesta. Well, the Dawn mission has also gone to Ceres. And uh, I'll, I'll let you know we've developed, uh, our team has developed a prototype for Ceres. And so that's one you can expect to see. Pluto is blowing everyone's mind right now. So we are absolutely thinking about that. Um, another one that really fascinates me is Mars's moon Phobos. Uh, that has great potential as a stepping stone to Mars. Uh, Mercury, we've got some great uh, data from the messenger mission. So yes, there are definitely plans to do more of these. Uh, right now, it's a matter of prioritization. And with the resource prospector mission coming up, and with our focus on looking at human landing sites on Mars right now, those are our two, two top priorities. But uh, we certainly have our eyes on additional uh, destinations, and you certainly can expect to see more of these portals in the future. So here's an interesting question uh, that uh, Jim brought up uh, in kind of in response uh, or in response to that or a follow-up to that. Um, the Voyager data that went by some of the, uh, say, some of the bodies uh, like Miranda that are orbiting uh, Uranus and Neptune, is there enough data in the Voyager data to be able to reproduce some of these uh, mapping projects? One of the problems that we face as we look across the solar system in you know, a, a prime example is Pluto. When we did not go into orbit around an object, we have really a very partial view. If you look at the data we have, say, for Pluto, um, or any of these bodies that we've essentially just done flybys of, then in those cases, we will have perhaps one hemisphere in really good resolution and the rest of the body in far less good resolution. So there's a qualitative difference that arises when you do a flyby as was done by Voyager or in the case of Pluto by uh, New Horizons versus orbital missions like what we have going around Mars right now, what LRO is giving us around the moon what uh, Don has done with Vesta and Ceres. So it isn't that we can't do them, and in a number of cases we will, but it is a lot easier and the results are typically a lot better when you have an orbital mission. Okay, I know that we're uh, just a little bit past time. Do you mind uh, hanging in there for a few more questions? We've got a few more that I'd like to throw out there if you... No problem, please. Okay, um, so in, in the uh, um, one with Vesta, uh, one of them noticed that there was a star field in the background. Was that uh, realistic or was that a uh, uh, one that was, you know, added in virtually, so, so to speak? You know, I am so proud of that team at JPL. And that is one of, as an astronomer myself, that was one of the first things I looked at. And what did this uh, team of software engineers do? And you know something? They accurately depicted the sky. So you all, 
Uh, if you can tear your eyes away from Vesta, you will in fact see uh, an accurate representation of the background stars. So we have another one staying with Vesta for a moment here. Um, Jeffrey noted that the uh, northern hemisphere of Vesta also appears dented. Was there an impact then there, or uh, have you inferred any uh, thing that went on with uh, the northern hemisphere of Vesta? Um, all of Vesta has taken a beating, but the magnitude of what happened near the south pole of Vesta far exceeds anything that occurred elsewhere across the surface. One of the things you'll notice too is the topology of uh, Vesta seems a little more pronounced at the South Pole, or excuse me, at the North Pole because of shadows. And that was the actual duration of Dawn's visit at Vesta. Quite frankly, during a good chunk of that visit, the North Pole was in shadow. And so you didn't see a lot of the North Pole, but uh, Toward the end of Vesta's, or Dawn's visit at Vesta, uh, the sun started coming out and giving some illumination to the North Polar region. But the shadows there are definitely more pronounced. And so the, uh, the variation in terrain is somewhat uh, more pronounced too. So here's a, a couple, I'm going to kind of uh, lump a couple in here together, and, and uh, you'll probably be able to sort this out. Uh, Robert asks, with a lower gravity level on Mars, would water flow have as much impact, uh, abrasion-wise, uh, on the surface, all things being equal, as it does on Earth, which then would kind of maybe lead into another question that Cliff asks is about is uh, Valles Marineris, an erosional feature, which that's certainly related to the ability of water to uh, cut down through, or is it uh, something else, say a rifting? Okay, so gravity is definitely involved in rheology, the, the nature of flow. Uh, the gravity on Mars is about one third what we experience here on Earth. That being said, as we look at these great outflow channels, we see evidence that there was, in fact, a very strong ability for flowing water to carve the landscape. So even in spite of the uh, lesser amount of gravity, the amount of water that was traveling through, and in some cases, the number of cases, this seems to be a cataclysmic release of water, uh, perhaps related to uh, perhaps surface ice being heated by, say, a large meteorite impact and releasing a magnificent deluge of a flood that would really leave its mark on the landscape as it went traveling downhill. Um, so, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, water can, even in the reduced gravity of Mars, do an excellent job of carving and shaping terrain. Uh, does that include Valles Marineris? Valles Marineris, unlike the Grand Canyon, does not seem to be primarily an erosional feature. It is more likely a crustal event, perhaps tectonic. Uh, we think that there may be a relation to the large Tharsis bulge, that big collection of giant volcanoes just to the northwest of Valles Marineris. That may not be a chance alignment. Uh, we don't have plate tectonics on Mars the way we do here on Earth. And as a result, uh, hot spot volcanism builds up much larger volcanoes than it does here on Earth. If you take a look at our largest volcanoes in Hawaii, the plate movement has dragged that out into a chain of volcanoes. But if the plate isn't moving, as in the case of Mars, then that just builds up into these truly gigantic volcanoes that then can weigh down on the crust and actually fracture the crust. And that may well be what we're seeing there at Valles Marineris is primarily a fracture in the crust, perhaps caused by that loading in the Tharsis bulge. That said, uh, there was clearly some subsequent alteration 
of that area by flowing water. So water did play a role, flowing water did play a role in what we see in Valles Marineris, but it was not the original cause. Okay, so kind of uh, shifting gears just a, a little bit, but still uh, following the water, so to speak. Um, if a form or forms of life are discovered on Mars, what protective actions would be taken to ensure these would not be detrimental to humans, either on the mission or potentially brought back to Earth? That's a very good point. Um, so NASA has an active planetary protection program. There's actually a person whose business card reads planetary protection officer. How's that for a cool business card? But basically, um, we want to be very careful about what we might bring back from Mars, but also it works both ways. We want to be careful about what we might introduce to Mars. Uh, if you look at the history of commingling of different species here on Earth, it hasn't necessarily been always a good story. Uh, think of, you know, when the European explorers ended up first coming to the New World and the spread of diseases that in Europe some defenses had been built up against, but which were entirely new and absolutely devastating uh, here in the New World and again across the Pacific. Um, if we introduce our bugs to Mars, it could be devastating to any life that's there. And similarly, we want to be very careful about any life that uh, we might bring back from Mars. So in terms of the materials that we are sending to Mars, if you take a look at our, so look at the sterilization procedures that are gone through for uh, when Mars 2020 lands and it starts digging holes, man, the, the, the sterilization procedure is really, really, really very detailed. We want to make sure that we don't introduce any of our bugs there to damage what might be there or also to confound our experiments. You know, it's, it's, it's a long way to go to study bacteria that we bring with us. Similarly, the question exists as to what do we do with the materials that we bring back from from Mars and how do we handle them? There was, of course, very careful quarantine procedures for the materials that were brought back from the moon and the moon is a far, far, far less likely place to actually contain any kind of biological activity. Um, some suggestions have been done in terms of looking at uh, processing some of these samples, perhaps in other locations. So perhaps, uh, in a location on the moon or even Phobos, where uh, you can set up a lab to do study, but then uh, if there is a breach, it's not going to get out into a viable environment. So uh, you have a number of plans that are in place and being worked on by uh, NASA Planetary Protection. Okay, well, let's go for one more question and then we'll uh, call it good. This is, uh, this is great. Uh, so a few of the of the people on uh, do work with some planetariums around, and they were and uh, Darren was interested whether or not um, these can be projected onto a planetarium dome. What sort of projectors might be needed? What kind of rendering uh, they might need to do to the images to be able to put them on a dome? What a wonderful, outstanding, excellent question, and that's a great one to end on. Um, I want to point out that what you have been looking at here are just a few of the clients that have been developed for this very robust back end. We have developed other clients besides these web clients. So there's a touch table client, done a hyperwall client, a prototype for, say, Oculus 3D goggles, and et cetera. So we're looking today at the web client, but the real real magic behind this is the back end, is the data and the serving of the data. And as a matter of fact, the way that we handle this, the team at JPL has de developed a number of uh, back end web services and APIs that make the data available to 
uh, outside systems beyond these clients. And so we've been working with the American Museum of Natural History and the Hayden Planetarium there and the California Academy of Science and their Morrison Planetarium. And we're able to actually serve this data to the planetariums. And one of the things that uh, the California Academy of Science has been doing is they actually have had held some workshops and will probably continue to do so for planetariums across the country and around the world, showing them how to take this data and integrate it into their planetarium shows. So it goes beyond just projecting the web browser onto the dome. You can actually access the data behind all of this and bring it into your planetarium system and show it in the full fidelity that your planetarium is capable of. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Brian. This is uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, that's all we have for tonight. All of you will be able to find this telecon along with many others on the Night Sky Network under the Outreach Resources section on the NSN website. Just search for webinar. We will also post tonight's presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube page by the end of the week. You can also find other resources and activities on this webinar's dedicated resource page. And now for our raffle. David will count the 